Hi, Adam. Hello, Jan. There's background noise. I'm going to mute. I only click on when I can have something to say. Okay. Hello. Yep. Hello, Ray. How do we? My presentation is in PowerPoint slides. How do we connect them to? Uh... Oh, it's quite easy, but it's a good thing you ask now before we begin. Uh, right. at, the, at the bottom of the screen, you should have a green button called share screen. Right. So what you do is you start the presentation on, in PowerPoint like normal by pressing F5 or however way you normally do it. Then in Zoom, you click square, share screen. You're allowed, I don't think you are actually muted. Me? I will no, mute. Jo yeah, Joel should mute. You don't think you are? No, I, did, I, I was in the process of doing something else. Oh, okay. But I was going to mute. Okay, uh, so so Ray, you can try it now. If you if you start your PowerPoint presentation, to so go to PowerPoint, press F five, or whichever way you normally start a presentation. Okay, uh, I've got it. I've got it set up to do a slideshow. Yeah, and, that's what. Uh, let you me know. let me try it here. Yeah, go for it. It's a good thing to try it before we actually start. Right. Uh, all this stuff from Zoom. Come on. You're about to, no, 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 no. I pushed the wrong button. Uh, let me find PowerPoint now. Here it is. And uh, I, I'm going to click slideshow now. Okay, and it's gonna, and I'm gonna say from the beginning. And so I have just a blank one here. Now, oops, how do I get to, uh, it's filling my screen now. Right, so if you hold your Alt key and, alt key, pre and alt, press Tab. Alt Tab. You should go okay. back to Zoom, or you might need to hold Alt and press Tab multiple times until you select yeah, okay. Zoom. So now when I share screen, uh, well, let me try it. Suppose yes. I share, share screen right now. Yep, go for it. And okay, and then pick out the, uh, pick this up. Yep, I, I unless the... uh, in your presentation, are you intending to only show PowerPoint or will you also show other things than PowerPoint? No, I will, I will just show PowerPoint. I, Perfect. You know, no, no, that that it's that's perfect. Then you just then you can choose PowerPoint. Otherwise, people often want to share multiple things, and then they, it gets all messed up. But if it's just PowerPoint, just click on that, and you should be good to go. Okay, well, I'll be ready to do that whenever whenever you want to get started. Well, if you, I'll, if, I'll if you have a, I'm sorry. If you have a front page, you can share it now. It doesn't hurt. It's not, yeah. Well, it's not, just to check that it works. Blank, it's an empty blank screen for me to talk about uh, what I. How I'm going to approach things. That's fine, but you can you can still share the screen. Then we see a you, we will see an empty blank screen. So what? It'll just be it just to check that everything works. Yeah. Okay. How's oh. that? Uh, I can see your PowerPoint application, not the presentation itself. Do you have two screens, or you only have one screen? Uh, well, I have two screens. I have you know pictures of us, and then I have this but i can uh now well you have two physical screens connected to your computer well no no just my laptop oh so try pressing start slideshow now uh, you can just press the f5 key on your keyboard it's the easiest way to do it do what if you press on your keyboard press f5 That's f5 it. Yeah, not the letter F, the F5 key. There's one one key labeled yeah. F5. Okay. Well, it gives me volume. It gives you what? Volume. Oh, I see. That's because it's a set to use something else. Okay. In that case, you can just you can just click in the bottom of your window. There's a little picture of a presenting thingy. You can click that. If you if you move your mouse down. Move my mouse down to what? To, to the right, a little bit to the right. You're almost there. A little bit further to the right. There's a, a little bit down. 
you see there's a slider. It says a bit further to the right, three buttons to the right. Three buttons to the right. That oh, one. Right. You just passed it. We're a little bit to the left of the slider. This this one. Click that one. So then you can click resume slideshow. You should go. Okay. There you go. It's all working. Okay. So I can start from here. Yep. Exactly. All right. Now we know it works. Yeah. Whenever you're ready. Well, it's a bit early. We still have 10 yeah, minutes. Certainly. I really appreciate this, Adam. Oh, no, I appreciate this. a lot of fun with it. In fact, I've, I've got, I don't know how much time you're going to let me have because I've got, uh, I've got a lot of things I could tell you. I mean, and, I, I'd rather go over time and hear everything you have to say. Then, then miss out on something. Let's say it like yeah. this. And and this is a recorded event, which means if somebody thinks it's taking too long, they're free to leave and watch it another day. Okay, fine. Uh, I think I'd like to have questions held to the end because uh, one question to me might uh, <laughs> avalanche into uh, a, a longer discourse than we really really should have then i will make sure to announce that at the beginning we all have the same problem yeah we all have a lot of reminiscences and once oh, we get yes. misdirected we go off on a tirade in the other place mm -hmm. i never really realized how long i was in computing and and uh, <laughs> some of the things that i forgot that i was involved in have come back so well so maybe now you understand why we all have so much respect for you. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm not joking. One little bit. No. It's been, you know, I have two passions. Or I've discovered I have two passions. Teaching and APL, or APL and teaching. I don't care where you go. But uh, I've been blessed to be able to do in my productive life those two things and you've mm -hmm. done them together right you've been teaching APL. Yep. absolutely well you'll see what i where i'm, I'm looking forward I'm i can't i can't wait so if uh, nine more minutes to go <laughs> okay well we shall see you know i, I in fact i don't care if anybody one wants to quick listen, comment have fun doing it one quick comment. When I read your first book, it opened my eyes to a whole new perspective on APL. I always had trouble with, with matrices and logical operations or Boolean operations. And your book was so clear to me that I could teach it. I couldn't remember it, but I could teach it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there's too much to remember about dialogue APL, you know, but that's one of the fun things. You never, you never know it all. And it's a challenge to get the new stuff. Well, Joel, I'm, I'm, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but uh, my current activity is to update my class notes that I've been using uh, lately into a textual material and, and it's getting to the point where uh, I might call it a book. And uh, a fourth book. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, it's aimed at, I'm, I'm way ahead of myself here, but since we're talking about it, I'll tell you, I'm aiming this text at high school, junior high and high school students, beginners. Because my attitude is, if kids are want to know something about programming, APL is the place to start. It's so darn easy. Yes, yeah. you can get extremely complicated, but well, you know, it's like English. We can talk, uh, you know, very simply, but we can also expound very complexly. Well, the same APL is a language. Only you want to talk. You're talking between a human being. And a computer. I would uh, love to see another book. It'd be amazing. Well, I'm close to the point. I'm, I think, a few months away because I've been doing other things. Oh, wow. Uh, 
where it needs to be a, needs to be critically reviewed. Maybe because we can I, we can I'm, help with that if you don't. Do you have people to review it for you or? No, I don't. So maybe we can help. We have we have some people, but that would be amazing. So if I did my my math right, your first APL book was published. 1978. 78? Not 75? No, 1978. Oh, okay. That's what it says on the book. Oh, now I'm looking at your website, but <laughs> it says it says 75, maybe that's a typo. Okay, but then even if it's if it's 78, that means over 40 years between the first book and this book. Um mm. in, in the same subject is uh, amazing. But uh, anyway, we shouldn't we shouldn't cut out too much of the of your material here from yeah right you have to wait for five minutes to the last people to arrive who want to be at the live event and then uh i'll briefly introduce you but i'm not qualified to really do so thoroughly oh come on i'm not you're such a adam i i respect you for being a really great apl programmer yeah i mean you, you make you do things so quickly i'm i well what your talks on dialogue it's so great that they're recorded because I can go back and slowly go through them and understand what you're doing. And by the way, you, your use of PowerPoint amazes me. I've got a, one of the things I have to do is learn learn something about power more about PowerPoint because uh, the things you do, you move the cursor around and jump around, and oh boy, I'm amazed. <laughs> If you ever have a class on PowerPoint, let me know. I'll be there. Front row. I hear. But uh, there's just too much to learn. Yeah. Well. Okay, we're almost there. Another couple of minutes. No, what happens if I do this?
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really honored to have uh, Ray Polivka here. Uh, his history with APL is absolutely impressive on, on all fronts. And he, he was right there with Iverson at the very beginning. So far, he has written three textbooks that, on APL books that I grew up with. They were on the shelf at home. Um, obviously, he received the Iverson Award. Uh, which is the highest award that an APL can receive. Uh, he was the editor of the uh, Quote Quad magazine and has been teaching and using APL for way longer than I think uh, any, most other people have. So without further ado, Ray, please uh, gift us with the history that you have. Okay, um, whoops, oh, wait a minute. Uh, pushed the wrong button here and I got started before I wanted to. How do we get back? Left arrow? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Is, is this visible to everybody? I'm going to be talking through PowerPoint slides. It, is this, this is very better? good. I can see it fine. Okay. Well, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, actually, I've discovered that I've been related to computers for 68 years. And uh, there is some of it, the time, uh, well, it's even before APL was started. And so I'm going to give you a bit of background of what I did, how I got into uh, computing, and there's some details so that you understand how I've, uh, where I am right now. And let so me just jump in for a moment. I forgot to say, Ray has requested that any questions um, and, and other comments should be held until the end so you don't get sidetracked. So yeah, jot down your right. notes and ask at the end. We will give time for that, no matter how late it is. Okay. Well, let's get going. Uh, and in the beginning, uh, I'm, I'm going to start by saying where I came from. I graduated from college in 1951, major in math, and, and was told to go to graduate school. So I went to the University of Illinois Graduate School, majoring in math. Computers, computing did not exist at that time. And uh, my second year, I was teaching unhappy business majors college algebra, which they always uh, delayed until their senior year. In the process, I went over to the en electrical engineering department and took a course from Jim Robertson, who was uh, explaining a division algorithm that he was using in ILIAC. Uh, this was in 1952. And ILIAC at that time was stood for Illinois Automatic Computer. And it at that time, there were only five digital computers in the world, and, Il and University of Illinois had two of them. One was ILIAC and the other one was ORDVAC. What happened was uh, they had a contract with the Aberdeen uh, Proving Grounds people to build a computer for them, which they called ORDVAC. Now, the dean of engineering at the school said, wait a minute, why don't we buy two of everything and uh, build ILIAC? And so they were, they had built Ordvac, and I think we're close to shipping it, but they at the same time were building ILIAC. And I discovered that they, they had assistant ships over there. And so I applied and was accepted. And so I think I can claim to be a first generation digital programmer because I wrote my first program in 1953. And while some of you may save your first first dollar, I saved my first program. Uh, I, I can't show it to you here now, uh, but uh, it, 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 it was called the read-around ratio test because the memory in ILIAC were uh, 40 uh, little cathode ray tubes, each of which had uh, 1024 uh, dots on a two to the 10th. And so the memory was 1K, but uh, 
at that time, how did you program? In binary, you know, like the instruction for load accumulator was four ones followed by zero one zero one. And uh, this, this was rather time consuming and difficult, but fortunately the English were way ahead of us in programming at, at was uh, Ed had a, David Wheeler came over on a sabbatical leave and a, one of the early things he did was create something called DOI, decimal order input. And so instead of writing four ones followed by zero one zero one, you could write L5, which represented the same, same instruction. And therefore we, we were able to program in, in sexadecimal and the, the characters we used were zero through nine and KSN JFL, which made programming a lot easier. My, my program was um, 146 state uh, words. And uh, well, that doubled that because each word in Iliac took, took two instructions, accommodated two instructions. Well, that was my first time, uh, first programming activity. Well, a little personal data. I got married in 1954. My wife always said she played second fiddle to the computer, but she didn't. I passed prelims, one of the major hurdles in getting a PhD in 1955 and uh, wrote to my draft board because we were drafting people at that time yet uh, that I'd passed prelims and unknowns to me, they thought I'd got my degree. So they Back, uh, Aberdeen because that's where Ordvac was. But they sent me to Fort Monmouth after basic training to program the 650. Now, a little side issue on 650. Marketing, IBM marketing people said, well, when we wanted to price it, how many can we sell? They guessed, well, we might sell five. Well, the one at Fort Monmouth was model number 15. And in fact, I believe they sold over 500. Boy, did they make money on that, didn't they? Well, after I finished my uh, two years in the army, I returned uh, to University of Illinois now with a son in addition. Well, that's fine. How did I get to a, uh, uh, APL? Well, while I was in Illinois, Fred Brooks came to interview me because IBM was looking for programmers too, I guess. Well, I was working at the computer science lab in doing programming in ILIAC. And so they said I would be interested in to them. Well, I graduated with my PhD and, and then joined IBM. Actually, when I, before I joined IBM, I was a little leery about joining them because at that time, their reputation was being a very stiff and uppity company. You had to wear a shirt and tie and suit and even a vest. Well, I didn't have that stuff. But uh, when Fred was interviewing me, he interrupted. It. Well, he, when he came, he was wearing a pith helmet. It was the summertime and I guess he didn't keep his head warm, cool. And uh, he also asked me uh, whether I could direct him to a hardware store or a bookstore, a shoe store, because he had a hole in the sole of his shoe that he wanted to get a patch for. Well, that actually was one of the things that made me uh, can say, my goodness, IBM can't be that stiff and formal. And so I did in fact, join IBM in 1958. Uh, before we get started too far, let, let me run through some APL history. In 1957, Ken Iverson was on the Harvard faculty, and uh, but he was not given tenure because, quote, he didn't write enough. So in 1960, he joined IBM and, and uh, teamed up with Aidan Falkoff. And Aiden, Aiden's job ultimately, uh, Aiden was also an APLer, became an APLer, but he he had the difficult crew in, in uh, IBM research. 62, uh, APL, a programming language was published. For three, IBM 360, the family of computers was announced. 
And that was a significant point because we had horsepower now to, to implement APL, which was implemented announced in uh, 1966. Uh, uh, and on November 27th, 1966, on the APL system on IBM research, uh, capability. And this has been the stake in the ground from which we say, when did APL start? say, uh, you know, 1966, if you get down to details, November 27th. And by 1968, APL 360 became the first commercially available APL uh, system. Just, just to put things in perspective here. Uh, when I joined IPM, I, 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 IBM, I uh, was assigned a stretch project. Now the stretch computer was IBM's uh, effort to build the fastest computer in the world. In fact, stretch was uh, stated to be 10 times faster than any existing computer in, 19, in the 1960s. It was shipped in 1961. And in fact, it was the fastest computer until 1964. I was assigned by Fred Brooks, who was architecting part of that computer, or he was on the architectural committee on it, uh, assigned me the, the uh, console. Well, uh, the engineers had, had, had uh, built the console with a lot of capability of single stepping instructions and, and viewing certain memory locations and that sort of thing. But the console also had three potentiometers. And one of the things Fred told me was, you know, right, find something to do with them. Well, I have to confess, my first programming project in IBM was a failure. I didn't know what to do with these potentiometers. In fact, why would you want to slow a machine down using a potentiometer when you're building the world's fastest computer? It couldn't, well, it didn't work out too well. And in fact, you, you find that no other IBM computer had any potentiometers ever connected to it. Uh, I, I joined after Stretch a, a group which was basically a software engineer engineering inter, uh, group where we in software were to read engineering specs to determine if there were any programming problems with what they did. And, and in that group, uh, a project came up called uh, Central Automation System, uh, and uh, it was called CAS for short. And the object of this program was to build a, an application uh, software for engineers to, to allow them to do microprogramming. Now here again, the English were ahead of us again, because Morris Wilkes, in 1951, wrote uh, uh, several papers and defined what microprogramming was all about. But basically, it was a, a way of organizing the, uh, for engineers, the m manner of setting, uh, turning on the proper uh, switches within the uh, CPU to do microprogramming. Uh, Currently, well, currently then, uh, it was done in a sort of haphazard fashion. Well, the, the CAS system was used in the 360 days for model 30, 40, 50, and maybe even the 60s, model 60. Uh, and so the thing that was really nice about that was one day in 1962, we were, we were working on it started that in their dares. There were five people, one manager and five people, two in Poughkeepsie and three in, in Hursley uh, programming this. And it turns out that the Hursley people had more access to the 7090 then than the two of us in, in Poughkeepsie. 
And so uh, one day I came home to my family and said to my wife, hey, get ready. We got to go to England in two weeks. Uh, and we spent six months there, six wonderful months, at least the kids and, and uh, Joe. Joe certainly enjoyed it, and, and uh, we built this system there. And I, when I returned back to the hardware software interface group, uh, I got a phone call in 1965 from my math department at my college where I graduated, asking if I would take a sabbatical leave and come back and teach because one of their staff members was again going to back to university to get his PhD. Uh, I said, yes. I thought maybe this would be fine for introducing my kids who were pretty young then, six and seven or uh, to college activities. Uh, the interesting problem there was, I was the first one in the Hud IBM Hudson Valley to ask for a sabbatical leave. <laughs> um, they weren't sure what to do. Uh, for example, when I was talking to them, HR people, uh, they said, well, we'll pay your way out there. And then they asked, well, who's going to pay your way back? And I paused and said, what? Don't you want me to come back? <laughs> um, they paid the way back too. Well, now 1966, you remember it was one clean load, one clean space. So uh, this is all my previous history. How did I get into APL? Uh, in 1966, Fred Brooks, by the way, Fred and, and, and Ken were both at Harvard at the same time, and one was a mentor to the other, and I don't know which way it was, but Fred and, and uh, Fred's family and my family got together, and I mean, his, his uh, wife played the organ at my church, but Fred had just bought a house here in, uh, in Poughkeepsie and, and had an open house in which he invited me and my family and, and, and Ken. And so when at this open house, guess what we talked about? Uh, everybody, well, not everybody, but a good number of us were talking to Ken about APL. What was it all about? And uh, Ken was pretty articulate about it, of course. And I got very curious and I discovered that uh, IBM Research in Yorktown Heights was offering uh, a class in APL or offering classes in APL as it turned out. And so I signed up and went down there and I the class, took a class from Al Rose. And uh, that's how I got started in APL because you get hooked if you really look at it seriously, don't you? Uh, now, in addition to this, IBM in 1965 purchased SRA, Science Research Associates. And they were a publishing outfit uh, that published textbooks and games and things for the uh, junior high, well, schools, school systems up to high school level. And they wanted, IBM purchased them to earn, uh, in order to develop CAI courses computer assisted instruction courses. Instead, I wanted to get hardware into it. Well, I got a phone call in 1967 saying, Ray, would you like to join SRA? They knew that I came from the Chicago area and that I knew APL. So, well, this guy's somebody we, we, we could use because we wanted to do all this CAI stuff in APL. Well, I said, no, I didn't want to. Uh, um, but I guess they really wanted me. So they offered me a different suggestion. Would you like to come for, spend one week a month in Chicago working on uh, SRA APL material? And I said, yeah, I'll do that. Because in fact, my mother still lived in Brookfield, which was a suburb of Chicago. And I could get onto the train and hop into the city and work and come back and spend the, evening uh, with my mother. And in fact, uh, I was there long enough, well, quite a few months, maybe six, I think. Uh, in the summertime, I brought my whole family there and, and uh, they went off and 
visited zoos and museums and all that sort of thing while I worked on CAI stuff. Uh, the team under Peter Cullingart was Bob Minnick, Sandra Pakin, and Ray Polifka. The material we, we started working on, uh, Peter created a, about a 90 page book entitled Introduction to Programming Language. I still have that. And Bob Minnick was working on computer circuits where he was defining computer circuits using APL. Uh, Sandra Pakin created the APL 360 reference manual, which is the one which did get published in 1968 and was popular enough that it went to the second edition. And I started working on problem solving techniques in, in programming and the like. But uh, uh, my things, things changed there at, at SRA after a while. But the two things I should mention that you probably have never heard of is the 1500 and the Selectric Typewriter computers, which, which uh, were related to APL. The Selectric Typewriter was basically the, the uh, typewriter sitting on top of about an inch of uh, hardware underneath it. And of course, you, your input was the keyboard and your output was uh, the printed page. Now, I bet some of you are looking at the 51. 100. No, I do not mean the 5100. The 1500 uh, was a separate, uh, wasn't a computer exactly. It was a, a hardware attached to the IBM 1050 computer, which uh, was hardware to do the CAI material that uh, we were creating or were trying to create at, at SRA. They built three of them, I think, because there was one downstairs on the first floor of the SRA building. And uh, we, we three were working up on the second floor. And the security was such that if you had, didn't even know about it or it, you could not see it, I never saw it. But they did build two of them that they uh, sent to two, two um, universities in Florida. And by the way, the Boca Return Lab was the, were the people building the 1500. But uh, obviously it did not get anywhere because at the time they sent it out there, all, the only thing available to them was APL. And the education people didn't know really what to do with it, I guess. So it never, it never saw the light of day, but uh, as you are all aware, the 5100 did much, much later down the road. Well, when I came back to Poughkeepsie, because you know, at, at a certain point, SRI said, "Now, Ray, you you really have to move." And I said, "Nope, I'm not going to move." And so I came back to Poughkeepsie, and I joined uh, Poughkeepsie IBM Education, where I spent most rest of my adult life in in IBM. At that time, in, in the 1960s, late 1960s, there was heavy demand for APL education, and in fact. Uh, we started, uh, while I was in education, I had to teach classes in Fortran and PL1, but very quickly I got into APL classes because that's what I wanted to teach anyway. And we held classes uh, once or twice a month for many years. And I'm considering that we had, uh, had teach also other, other heavy teaching that had to be done for the new hires that we had in Poughkeepsie. That was pretty good. And ultimately, we had 17 3270 display terminals in the APL classroom, which was really great. Um, the instructors that we had there were myself, and Janice Cook, Kent Harrelson, and Alan Graham. I'm sure you know all about Alan. He was quite an APL programmer himself. But the one other thing that we did there was remember, recall, I was familiar with microprogramming. And so, we built a APL microprogramming simulator and Kent Harrelson did the programming of it or most of it. And uh, it turned out to be very, very popular. Why? Because the CAS system that we had done uh, in, in, uh, in England, but had to be compiled. And now get an engineer to, do, to design the microprogramming steps to do a load accumulator, for example, submit it and then compile it and get it back. Ugh, it was not very popular. 
APL was was uh, instantaneous, you see. And the, it was one of the very popular courses. And one of the things I remember about it, I really liked was we'd give them instructions in the morning class, it was a full day class. We'd give them instructions in the morning about uh, microprogramming and, and the simulator, et cetera. And then uh, we have them do some microprogramming. Uh, we had an art of a, a small, modeled a small uh, CPU and we'd give them instructions to write the microprograms to do an ad and, ad and store, uh, you know, machine instruction commands. And what usually happened was when we came back after lunch in the afternoon, uh, one time I walked in and said, well, fellas, how you doing? What are you doing? You have any questions? And one guy looked at me and said, yeah, get out of here. We want to do this programming. I love it. Well, my teaching uh, was involved mostly with APL. And I uh, taught many class, full-time classes at many IBM labs. Uh, these are just some of them that I, that I had. Uh, IBM had a lot of development laboratories at this time. The one I did not do was in Endicott because in Endicott, there were five engineers that took turns teaching APL there, but they did it one day a week uh, for 15 weeks. Now that, that was not uh, use, useful at teaching offsite. So Poughkeepsie became the place where we did offsite computing uh, APL uh, teaching because of that. Uh, I had the opportunity as, as time went on to teach uh, internationally. Now, all of my teaching, uh, well, almost all of it, was to IBMers. And now what about international? Well, I taught twice in Hong Kong to uh, basically I, uh, the IBMers that interacted with customers. I don't know what you call them. Then and, and uh, also taught in Australia and Belgium and, and Thailand, the Thailand IBM Research Lab there, and, and Russia. Russia was the most difficult, difficult one. This happened in, uh, in 1999, and excuse me, 1992, where uh, the, the wall had come down. And at that time, uh, the APL conferences that I'm talking about was held in, in uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, Sasha Skomorikov, uh, a, a Russian who had become interested in and knowledgeable in APL, asked if I would like to give a class, an introductory class. It was actually only two days, I think, uh, in APL to a little college in 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 in, uh, in Russia. In uh, can't remember the city. Uh, which was 101 kilometers outside of Moscow. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, at that time, uh, US diplomats were only allowed to go uh, 100, no more than 100 kilometers outside of uh, uh, Moscow. Well, the site was where the little college town was, Obninsk was the name of the city, was an atomic energy center place. And that's why they didn't want anybody going 101 kilometers. Well, that seemed to change after the wall came down. Anyway, uh, the reason that was a, such a difficult class was I had to do it through a translator. I didn't know Russian. And so what I had to do was you know, make a sentence or two, pause, have the translator translate it. Well, you know what happened. I got carried away with APL <laughs> and, and uh, you know, started telling them all about something or other. And the poor translator would hold up his hand and say, stop, stop. Um, well, I had, I had a lot of fun doing that, but I'm not sure they got too much of, but a, a, a sort of a lick off the lollipop of, on APL. After I, after I retired from IBM, I became a Polifka Associates, that was me and my wife, and I continued teaching in Poughkeepsie and San Jose, APL, uh, IBM sites. 
and Boulder's aircraft and Connecticut and New Jersey were insurance companies. And uh, also in the process of things, I made brief presentations, mostly, particularly at conferences, mostly educationally oriented. Well, in Japan, Taiwan, and New Zealand, there were you know, brief introductions of what APL is all about. But uh, uh, as, as I said earlier to, to Aiden, to Adam was I had I have two passions and one is teaching and the other one is APL and so I've been very fortunate to do both of those. Now books, the interesting thing I always thought, oh, gee, there weren't very many APL books published. But I I began searching through my library and I discovered that uh, I have eight international books. That is three in German, Japanese, two in Russian, two in Spanish. And some of them were translations of English books, our English books. And surprisingly, in the 1970s and 80s, a lot of academic folk, particularly academic folk, were creating uh, books in their particular disciplines and, and using APL in the process. And there, I, I found I have 18 books that, that do that. And of course, I discovered, to my surprise, that there were uh, I have 20, almost 20 books uh, that are, were presenting APL. And by the way, I have, I have that listing. If anybody's curious and wants it, I can email it to you. And if you find you've got a book or know a book that I don't have on the list, let me know, I'll put it on the list. Now, uh, what about my involvement in books? Well, uh, I've been involved in three books, APL, The Language and Usage by Polifka and Pakin, which came out in 1975. Yes, Adam, you're right. It was 75, not 78. Uh, APL Two at a Glance by Jim Brown, Sandra Pakin, and Ray Polifka came out in 1988. And APL Two in Depth by Norman Thompson and Ray Polifka in 1995. Why talk about APL, the language and the uses? 1975, what was available to, to uh, produce tech? produce books. Now look, Sandra was in Chicago, Polifka's in Poughkeepsie. And we started this in 1973, I think. And uh, how did we communicate? <laughs> US mail, phone, and, and fortunately, Sandra had still had contacts with IBM as a consultant and had access to APL. And so uh, right print MSG. It was not, there was no internet. You know, think of the things you do today that didn't exist then. And one of the things that really helped, by the way, you, 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 we used the, I used the 1050 initially to type in information. Yes, I had to type it in. But one of the things that was really, really useful, somebody in research had developed a scheme where as you typed in your English words, you came to a place where uh, you had needed to type in uh, uh, APL characters. They had a, you could tag, you entered a tag and then you typed the APL characters and then you entered the tag saying that that's all. You know, one tag says APL, the link, the next, last tag said end of APL. And uh, so we could, create a document that would print like that. But when we send it to APL, uh, to Prentice Hall, the, uh, the publisher, uh, we sent it in two copies. One printed in with just the APL characters and the other copy was just the non-APL characters, the words in that. Uh, you know, that sort of like, sounds like a cut and paste job. Uh, it got done. Prentice Hall was very supportive. And so, uh, I can't show you, but I can show you the book. It's 579 pages of, of APL. And uh, it uh, was interesting. I don't know how all the other books sold, but you know, an interesting thing, after 1975, in the APL classes in Poughkeepsie, all the students got a graduation present. They got a book. I wonder what it was. Now, further, further uh, 
publications, APL two at a glance in 1988. Uh, we started in 1986, uh, Jim and Sandra and, and I, and uh, things were a lot better uh, communicating then. Uh, I think we had HTML or some some way of writing material, and and uh, things went pretty well until the final printing. When Jim got when Jim sent the document to Prentice Hall uh, and talking to the uh, publisher, the uh, he said, "Well, we've got we've got some uh, APL characters. They're unusual symbols." And the uh, publisher that he talked to said, "No problem. We can we can handle that." Well, when it came back, it was awful because. Uh, they didn't use APL symbols. They used whatever symbols they found in their, in their lead collection, and uh, plugged them in, and and it was, well, totally unacceptable. Well, by that time, John McGrew, who, who has more ink in his blood in his veins than blood, I think, is an excellent publisher, and and was publishing uh, things for uh, Sig APL. Uh, he. Jim turned to him and said, John, can you do this? And John got permission to do that uh, and use a, a rather uh, special IBM uh, printer 4250. I think it printed on aluminum or some such thing. Aluminum was involved. Anyway, it produced excellent copy. And so the APL at a two glance that you have or right now is the result of all of that. Uh, very readable book, folks. Still timely today. And finally, in 1995, APL two in depth with Norman Thompson. Again, Norman was in Scotland, and I'm in uh, I'm in uh, Poughkeepsie. Norman was also in IBM. Uh, we had it much easier to communicate, and uh, using the continued development of uh, APL facilities. So that's the story on textbooks. Now, uh, here's, here's one of proceedings that was produced in IBM, proceedings of the APL ITL committee. What's that all about? Uh, this particular issue I, I printed here is celebrating the 20th anniversary of uh, APL continuous service in IBM. Well, ITL stands for interdivisional technical liaisons. And in IBM, some of the people at uh, the high levels began to recognize that, you know, we've got many labs and they're all doing various things to build the computers. And some of them are certainly doing overlapping work, you know, like in printers, uh, Endicott was doing printing and, and uh, uh, I can't remember who else was working on printing or display systems, everybody was working on uh, others were working on that. So what they said was we need to have some on-site conferences where these people in these different labs can come together and, and talk about what they're doing and, and uh, argue and discuss about what they should be done. And uh, the APL community said, yeah, we'd like to have an ITL also. So an I APL ITL group uh, was organized uh, and this was the only programming language ITL, the rest were hardware oriented. But from 1977 to 1991, we had meetings and we had 28 of them. You got to get, you were able to, you were entitled to have two meetings a year. In other words, every, every half year, biannual meetings and at various sites. In fact, one of the sites we held was in uh, <clears throat> Australia after an APL conference. The attendance varied from uh, 25 to 84. And uh, I served as program chairman for quite a number of them. You know, that job was to get people to write up what they're doing so we could publish it in the ITL proceedings that, that you saw a copy of the, in the previous foil. Uh, it, it got in contact with a lot of APLers in IBM. Now, let, I'm, I mentioned the term SIG APL. Let me, I'll, I'll give you more details about that in, in, in future slides here, but 
SIG APL, one of the functions of SIG APL, which, stand, which stood for special interest group in APL was to hold conferences. And uh, the first conference that was held was not held by SIG APL, it was held by SHARE. Uh, and SHARE was the organization that IBM created uh, for them to interact with uh, their customers. And so SHARE, the SHARE organization, uh, again, produced annual conference, at least annual conferences for customers of IBM and, and computers, of course, customers that use IBM computers and uh, IBM people where they could interact with each other with the customer and tell you what they wanted and IBM would tell them what they were getting. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, share people, the APL people in share held a conference in 1969, which they called the March on Armand, where they, in fact, wanted to tell uh, IBM what they wanted in, I, in, in APL. And one of the major things they wanted was be able to uh, have, handle file handling. Anyway, uh, these conferences then became part of SIG APL's role and APL conferences were held from 1970 to continue annually to 2003. We actually had 34 APL conferences. They were numbered APL, you know, uh, APL like APL 78 there, which by the way was held in 1978, of course, in Rochester, New York, and the attendance was uh, uh, over 700 people. That was the most we, any of the APL conferences had. I served as vice chair and chairman of uh, the uh, SIG APL uh, in, from 1979 to 1980, and you know, my job was to get conferences, get somebody to be the conference chair and organize, or organize that. And one of the other things we did in 1983 was create the Kennedy Iverson Award for Arts for Outstanding a, uh, APL. Uh, and the first one was issued in 1983 and, and uh, to Aidan Falkoff who really, really deserved it because the role he played in keeping APL going in, in research uh, to allow Aiden, uh, to allow Ken and the, and the Stanford students that joined IBM to write APL. Without him, it would have been much longer happening. And the second one was to Garth Foster, who I will be telling you more about later in the slide. These, these uh, awards were, uh, awarded annually from 1983 to 2001, except for 1992, where the APL conference was in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, the, la the last two were in 2007 uh, to the APL2 products and services team, the guys that built APL2. And the final one was in 2016 to Morton Krumberg and Gita Christensen uh, for Dialogue APL. I received an award in 1990. Now, uh, interestingly enough, uh, there were other APL conferences that were going in, in, uh, uh, and one of them was the APL as a tool of thought and that ran from 1983 to 1994. There were eight of them. They were done by the New York version of, they called themselves New York slash APL. With the, they were the APLers in New York City that held conferences there. And the nice thing they did, they held their conferences in high schools in New York City. You know, they rented some room in them. And this way, we hope that some of the high school kids uh, got Thank interested you. in APL. And the other conferences that were held in this period of time were APL plus win or APL 2000, uh, 95 to 2006. Uh, one of the things that they did a couple of times, they asked me if I would teach an introduction to APL, uh, maybe half day or two days during the conference time. The reason for that was uh, 
the people that came to the conference would often bring their families, which would include some of their young, some of their children, and some of them were older. And also uh, later, they, um, I think maybe on the last one or so, they made it available to local students. And I think that's, that was a pretty good idea. Uh, maybe your dialogue people might wanna think about that in future user conference as well, make it, make it a uh, introduction available to local students or college, college profs. Anyway, um, that happened. Now, I've mentioned Garth Foster. Here's a picture of Garth that we had on one of our, quote, quote, one of our publications. And Garth played a tremendous role in supporting APL and actually growing APL. So let me tell you about Garth. Garth is no longer able to talk for himself now. He's no longer with us, so I'll do the talking for him. Garth was a professor at Syracuse University. And while there, in the, he was in the computer science department. While there, he was given the job of being liaisons with APL, with IBM, uh, uh, investigating time sharing. And he was given access to APL 360, and he knew nothing about it. So he read some of the documentation about it and got on and tried it out. And as he says, I was hooked. Now, the march on APL, as I mentioned earlier, um, by the share group, the APL people in share group, uh, put pressure on IBM. And now we're talking about the APL group in share. And they made Garth the chairman of the APL share group uh, because he was neither a customer nor an IBMer. He was in, you know, academics. And he did three things. Send out newsletters, help create SIG APL, and proposed the Minnebrook Conference Center uh, as a place for APL implementers to come and discuss what they were doing. See, by this time, um, other companies and, and schools were thinking about creating something equivalent to APL. Well, let me tell you now more about the uh, SIG APL, Special Interest Group in APL. Garth was uh, the chairman of uh, SHARE APL, and it was only for a APL, IBM APLers, IBM customers. And he, he recognized very quickly that we needed a separate APL organization that would include APLers who were not IBM customers. And so, uh, in 1970, there was an APL uh, conference then. Uh, they asked a a a ACM whether we could have a special interest group in, in a APL. And they said, no, you got SIG plan. And that was good for a special interest group in programming languages. Well, uh, by 1971, when, when Cher had an APL conference then, um, we we were talking about oh forget the ACM which was the professional ACM is the professional society for computer scientists we we're going to forget the ACM and uh, start up our own organization well we had two friends at that time one was Alan Perlis uh, at Yale who had previously been the chairman of SIG president of 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 SIG uh, of uh, ACM and the current president, Walter Carson. Uh, well, Alan Perlis, Perlis was an APL uh, pusher. He really liked it. And uh, Walter Carlson, who was current president of ACM, was an IBMer who also knew about APL. And so they said, we'll get together. And by 1972, ACM came back and said, OK, you APLers, you can have a STAPL. What the heck is STAPL? Well, that stood for SIG Plan Technical Committee on APL. Now, oh, come on, we're not going to use that term. We just said we're SIG APL. And that's how SIG APL came about. The role of SIG APL then was two, twofold. One was to produce conferences, hopefully annually. And the other one was to produce a uh, information document, documentation, 
which uh, came out uh, as code quad. And uh, let me tell you about code quad. Again, Garth Foster had played a role here because when, when uh, after the march on Armonk, uh, he created newsletters, which he labeled share, S, uh, share power sign APL slash 360 newsletters. He sent out three of them over the year and a half that followed. And uh, now we had SIG APL going and uh, he said, well, we've got to change the name. And he created the name Quote Quad. Well, you all know if you're APLers what Quote Quad does for you. And I think it was a very appropriate choice. So um, the last share APL 360 newsletter he sent out was um, over 400 of them, which he had prepared and, and it was more than he could do. So we found local editors to do that. And the first Coach Quad that came out was volume one, number four. You will never see volume one, number one. And they were intended to be published quarterly, four times a year. And four times a year from January, 1970 to the last one published was in December, 2007. Many, and in them, uh, one of the things I did was con conduct many personal interviews. I, for example, I interviewed Eon Sharp and I interviewed even some uh, vendors, uh, customers of APL. And, they, and uh, I interviewed Garth, for example, as well. And uh, there were other interviews as well. Uh, many, many served as editors over this time because the thing I need to point out in SIG APL and in Quote Quad, all of this work was done voluntarily. Nobody got paid for anything. And it, some of it got, got pretty, uh, was pretty time consuming. Actually, uh, John McGrew was an editor for 12 years. I joined him in 1994 and we served as a, uh, I was the executive editor and John was the production editor for, and I guess this was eight or nine years. Uh, and it, uh, I think we were the longest consecutive editors in, the, in, in producing Quote Quad. Now, the last thing I mentioned that, that Garth ha had done was early, again, after the first March on Armonk, was uh, to establish Minnebrook. What was Minnebrook? Minnebrook was a conference center that Syracuse University Hill had in the Adirondacks and uh, where they rented out to, to uh, small groups to have to come there to, and hold small conferences. And he established uh, a Minnebrook workshop in 1969 and they continued. Uh, and in 1995, we called them APL Futures Workshop. And they, they were very interesting in the fact that the discussions were, in for, were centered around what they were doing or what, what, what we might or should do and, and why. There was never any discussion of how'd you do it? How'd you program it? Uh, no, it was largely on an architectural level. And, the, the information there was uh, uh, not to be discussed beyond that. And uh, it, we met biannually every two years. It continues to this day. In fact, the September 2021 meeting was canceled due to COVID. Now, it, it, it appears to be, have been or it's viewed on the outside as a invite only restriction, but that's not really the case. The problem is the Minibrook uh, facility only can handle up to about 80 people in their lodgings. But if you have an opportunity to come to one of those meetings, uh, it's, it's really great. The Adirondacks in, in the fall are, is beautiful. The housing is great. The meals are 
outstanding. And the fellowship is beyond what you can expect. I mean, it's, it's, it's APL, APL is giggling together. Uh, I've attended most of them. Well, time marches on. Uh, I retired in 1993. Uh, shortly thereafter, I created uh, Polifka Associates, that is me and my wife, and I continued to do APL activities. I, uh, one of the things I created for APL 2000 were LTD modules. LTD stands for learn through doing. Uh, my philosophy has always been, at least in programming languages, you cannot understand that language unless you actually do it. And so what, what these modules were about was something that uh, could be done after you had an introductory programming course, because teaching, introducing programming APL to uh, APLers, you can't cover all of it. So uh, there were always things you wanted to know or needed to know. For example, how do you do file handling in APL? How, how do you do graphics in APL? Well, I created modules or were starting to create modules uh, like that. So if you had a understanding of APL, then you could go to a module like uh, file handling and and there were, you know, pros and and uh, discussion of what it was all about, how you would do it, and and uh, a question answer series uh, on how to do it and doing it. And uh, well, they're pretty much out of date now because now, I guess we have everything online, and you can you can zoom or do whatever you want on it. But uh, they never saw the light of day. Uh, I continued teaching uh, revenue producing courses. My last one was 2011. Uh, again, I said insurance companies, aircraft company, and, and IBM. Currently, in my last nine years, I've been locally doing summer classes for the local junior high and senior high students when I can capture them. And I've been offering one week halftime courses uh, in problem solving, Remember what I was doing in, in uh, SRA? Never lost track of that. And uh, uh, APL, uh, a introduction to APL classes, and, and I've been using dialogue. Now, I, as I said, some of you before we got started, I'm in the last few years, I've been converting my class notes into textual format, and, and uh, it's beginning to look like it could be an interesting book. The design of the book. Uh, is aimed at beginners, at, at junior and senior high school students. And I'm, I'm aiming at introducing APL to students of that age where, where they have not really programmed anything. Because I believe APL is the first programming language that students could and should encounter because it's so easy. Yes, it can get complicated, but at any rate, I'm uh, also struggling to keep up with all of the APL activity, which continues to grow and I'm enjoying it immensely. That just about ends my presentation. Uh, I have some odds and ends of things if we have time and you wanna hear about it. For example, how did I come by 25100 computers, of which I still have one in my basement. By the way, it still works and other things. Oh, the thing that I want to tell you, uh, Adam, is you need another APL campfire on Vector. Vector is this outstanding publication that the British uh, APL crew produced for uh, uh, a long time. And the latest one I have, uh, at least I pulled off the shelf is in 2011. I'd like to know uh, uh, a little bit about the history of that because their publication was really, really excellent. I don't know how often a year they, did they publish it once a year? Maybe some of you listeners can tell me, was it published once a year or by uh, semi-annually or whatever? Anyway, uh, uh, I, I need to come to a conclusion now. I think we've been going, well, exactly an hour. Uh, 
So these are my final comments. And I have one more slide to show you, which is uh, uh, that John McGrew produced for uh, one of our APL covers. And I think it, it's the summary of APL. Thank you very much. All right, this was just amazing. Um, that's uh, and and your timing is impeccable. Obviously, you you're obviously an experienced speaker. If you can do this down to the minute, this. no, I talk fast. And I know we have at least one question about something you said early on, and maybe people want to hear about those extra talking points that you had as well. Um, so. Go ahead. Oh, can shall I uh, close my uh, PowerPoint presentation? Well, you, here? you can leave it up for now. It's because if people want to go back I to think, those, I think it's fine to look at this one because uh, I think it's great. So, what's the question? Well, the one somebody wrote actually in the APL Orchard, yeah, and it's written here in the in the chat as well. Rory is asking about uh, Paren MSG. What was that and how did it work? You spoke about it early on when you were authoring your first book. Did you use that to communicate with each other? Yeah, well, you could send messages to uh, APLers. It was, uh, we, we, were, we were able to, to write print MSG and type in a message to, to, it stood for message. So you'd write what the programmers, the other APLers handle and then a message? The other, other people could, could uh, get that message. It sent it to somebody. And I don't remember all the details, but uh, it was for short messages, I think. Right Anybody else? MSG any APLers out there? APL two out, out there? Remember? Yes, it was uh, right print MSG followed by a port number, and you'd get their port number from the ports command, and then you had 120 characters for uh, your message. So it was instant messaging. It's a precursor to. Uh, Twitter, for instance, um, works pretty much just the same way as that. Yeah, it was a like a primitive chat, and uh, very very effective. We used it on Sharp all the time, and the the only thing of any that was halfway difficult was getting the port number. So there was the ports <laughs> command. You do a right print ports, and you see, you know, like I think back then Chicago was forty two. I think, you know, lucky number. So you do a right print ports 42, you'd see who's there. And ah, there, there's, uh, there's Michael. You get his port number from that and then send the right print message, you know? So, yeah. Uh, but is, Joey wants to say something. Yes, <clears throat> there was a 120 character limit as John pointed out, unless you were a hacker like I was when I first used APL on a 1050 and without an APL type element, by the way, and learned that it required a carriage return line feed in order to send the message. So I just put carriage returns in and typed many lines of input to the system operator who <laughs> replied back, how did you do that? So it was one of my first uh, having fun with people using APL. And another story in the same regard, in the early, <clears throat> uh, well, in the late seventies, uh, IP Sharp had uh, uh, local access in Moscow. That is, people in Moscow could dial up and use APL. And it always amused me that uh, I had a 1200 baud, very high speed connection. And I had a better connection to people in Moscow doing research and could chat with them than the White House had through the red phone, which was a telex machine at 110 baud. <laughs> Yeah, remember, remember, also. remember the 1050 entering stuff. If you paused, if you paused to to write the note or something, you got disconnected. And so you what you had to do is you typed stuff every once in a while, uh, hit the hit the uh, uh, space key, space key to keep connected. It drove you nuts for a while. I remember our 1050 wouldn't work in place of a 2741. It would simply just uh, just hang. So you'd start APL, it was under a system called Music, which was sort of like VSPC today. And uh, so APL 360 ran as a subsystem under Music. 
and it supported the 2741 fine, but the 1050, forget it. You could get into APL, you could type plus plus one plus one, but but that was it. After that, uh, that was, you know, you were hung somehow. Let me make another comment about the message command also. Um, although I, throughout my career, tried to uh, keep up with um, new forms of technology as they came out. One place where I was behind the curve was in, in finally getting a uh, smartphone. Uh, our son had a smartphone for a few years before my wife and I had gotten them. So we, we finally got smartphones. And um, I showed my son, you know, wow, we're, we're uh, finally catching up here. He said, oh, wow, you know, you're almost into the 21st century here. This is great. Can I send you a text message now? Would, do you know what that is, a, a text? And I said, I've been using uh, instant messaging since 1971. And he looked at me like I'm from a different planet. I was like, what, what are you talking about? And of course, that was the right paren MSG. Um, and I was saying before that it was sort of a precursor to Twitter. Really, the, uh, the better comparison is it's almost identical to text messages. So you have to go read your messages? Because I suppose they wouldn't just print in the middle of whatever you're doing. No? They would, um, which if you're trying to print a report is <laughs> something you wouldn't want. So you could do right print MSG off uh, and it would hold messages. I'm and, sorry, it would not hold them. It would uh, prevent messages. Similarly, you'd get operator messages, you know, APL shutting down in five minutes and all or right. th thunderstorms in area save often things things like that from SDSC. Um, no, it was uh, yeah, operator messages and message messages were you know the same class of, of thing. Yeah. One one more messaging story at uh, Eugene McDonald's memor memorial service. <clears throat> his son Peter remembered bringing his smartphone, or I think at the time it was a flip phone even. And saying to his dad, oh, look what you can do with this phone. You can send people messages on your phone. And Eugene got up, he said, and said, well, I invented that. <laughs> and Peter said in reply, oh, yeah, you invented text messaging and Al Gore invented the Internet. And he said his father got up, walked into the other room, came back holding a U.S. patent saying, well, did Al Gore patent it? <laughs> and he got a files patent for textual messages between telephonic devices that was issued in the late 40s, which was pretty impressive. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to jump in here for a second before I have to leave. Say, Ray, I yes. was one of the founding members of the New York SIG APL chapter. Yep. Uh, there were six of us. We started it, we grew dramatically. People came down even from Poughkeepsie or Yorktown to some of our meetings. Uh, we finally had to say, if you still want the meetings, some of you have to help out because the six of us can't carry it anymore. Anyway, I thought you'd like to know that. Very good. I was yeah, also supposed to meetings, Joel. Yeah, I also was supposed to be one of the members of the SIG APL committee for SIG APL 89 in New York. But I became ill in the middle of my work and I had to drop out completely from computing. I just got back a couple of years ago, as Adam can tell you. That's what I have to say right now. By the way, Ray, thank you for the presentation. It was well done. Thank you. It was fun doing it, Joe, Joey. There, there are a lot of lot of stories and a lot of things that that uh, I certainly didn't cover. The the uh, the J. I'd like to know more about the the J activities. They published a lot of stuff, and uh, you know, yeah, still active today, I think. And uh, certainly the vector people. And you know, there's a lot of a lot of APL activities that that's out there that historically is, I think, rather rather interesting. And should be captured. Uh, I had a very quick question about North Central College. 
was that like in Naperville or Bolingbroke or in one of those places? It was in Naperville, Illinois. Yeah. Okay. So was there, I remember a North Central College on Foster Avenue in Chicago. Oh. Yeah. I don't know if it, it was North Central something. Was that, in, uh, so to your knowledge, that's not uh, related. No, it's anyway. not related. North Central College's campus was on uh, in Naperville, Illinois, which now is, quote, the second largest city in in uh, Illinois. It's about uh, maybe 45 miles uh, due west of uh, uh, Chicago Center. Burlington, if I remember correctly, train there. Um, yeah. Yeah. You must you must be uh, related Chicago. to the Chicago area too, Walter. Uh, in fact, I lived. I met Sandra Pakin once. She lived pretty close to me. She lived on Sheridan Road, I believe. Yes. I met her one time somewhere She's around still there. that time. Yeah, she doing okay? I think so. Yes. All right. No, I, I met her briefly once. Mm -hmm. I don't remember where. So, but yeah, I'm from Chicago, probably lived two miles from where Sandra Pakin lived so okay thousands of advantage miles away today from there but uh... <laughs> uh, okay any other questions for for Ray now is your chance well I'll, I'll share a couple of stories with you if you're interested how did I get two fifty one hundreds you know, you all know what the 5100 is. It's this, uh, quote, portable, IBM's attempt at a, a, a portable computer uh, that I can't remember when it was when it was put out in the, uh, oh, I have it here somewhere. But at any rate, the 50, what, beg pardon, John? 1975. 1975, the 5100 came out. Okay. It was a machine, a self-contained machine with a small display and uh, a cartridge uh, input instead of a tape. And it had two languages on it, a switch. You could choose one of two languages. One was basic and the other one was APL. And boy, was that popular. Uh, it, it sold very well when it was, this is, this is before PCs came out. So this was the, you wanted your own personal private computer, this is what you got. Uh, in fact, it was so popular uh, in one of the labs here in Poughkeepsie, one of the lab groups that was uh, engineering and labbing, a lab engineering group, uh, the manager said, we need one. In fact, we'd like to have two. And uh, they couldn't get them. Uh, salespeople said, "No, you gotta, you gotta wait. We, we've got too big a demand." So what does he do? He turns to his engineers and says, "Get the parts. We'll build it." And so they did build it, and uh, and and I think they built two of them. Anyway, right, they built it and used it very properly. Well, time marched on, and the 5100 became obsolete in the sense that. Uh, PCs came around and all that. And so IBM regularly came around and says uh, to all, all the labs, send back all your uh, obsolete material and, and equipment. Well, the 5100 was one. The problem was the one thing they could not get building that 5100 was a serial number. And because it had no serial number, they could not return it to the uh, uh, people. And so what did they do with it? Well, one of their, one of their guys was re retiring. So what they did was wrap the 5100 up in white paper, put a red ribbon around it and give it to them as a retirement uh, package. They gave them the 5100 and the printer and all the documentation. And, and, and uh, so that happened. Well, years, further past, my wife uh, was a grise sailor and was looking for some glass that she collected. And I'm standing on, uh, by the car sort of waiting for her to come back. And the fellow next door says, hi, Ray, how are you? And, I, and, and identified himself as, well, he was the guy that got the retirement package, the 5100 is a retirement package. He said, 
and you know, it's sitting here in my basement. Would you like it? And I said, sure. And that's the one that is now sitting in my basement. Uh, I did give away the printer, which I, sorry, I didn't. And the same thing happened at Vassar College. Vassar had, had uh, also purchased uh, 50, a couple of 5100s because uh, Vassar at that time uh, was even, uh, well, I, I taught a class there and was interested in APL. But again, the 5100 was obsolete. And they also gave it to a guy who retired. And when he died, his wife called me and said, would you like the 5100? So at one time I had two of them sitting in my basement, one of which now sits, the Vassar one now sits in uh, the uh, computer museum in, in uh, where is it? Somewhere in Sunnyvale or somewhere out there. So whenever you go over there and you see the 5100, you tap and say, uh, uh, hi, Vassar uh, 5100. But uh, interesting story that these engineering guys were clever enough to get all the parts and build a darn thing themselves. Interesting yeah, side yeah. story. I can give you a related story on giving up the machines. Uh, I worked for, uh, worked in the time sharing group at IBM in Kingston for a number of years. Um, so we had mainframe computers at our disposal, of course, but um, we, we saw the 5100 and thought that's a wonderful device. We'd really like to have those in the department, not to use as computers because it was pretty slow compared to using a mainframe if you have a local connection. But um, as a terminal, it was a, a wonderful machine. Now, instead of using a 2741 on 134 baud, we could use the blindingly fast speed of 300 baud, which was just unimaginable. Never mind the fact that line speeds today are a million, literally 1 million times the speed of that. But um, we got two of them uh, with the leather carrying cases and used to take them home on weekends and uh, use them as terminals. And it was just a wonderful device. And we just, even after we uh, stopped using them as a primary device, we just loved the machine. There were two of us who used them all the time and just thought these were wonderful. Um, finally, our manager came to us and said, I just got a bill and I just realized that we've been paying rental charges on these every month. And um, I don't know if you still use them or still need them, but um, you know, I, I know you guys like them. If you wanna keep them, come up with a um, reason as to why we have to have them. Otherwise, you know, we're gonna have to send them back because we have a, a notice here saying to return machines to Raleigh, North Carolina, if they're to be disposed of. Uh, we, we pondered this for quite a while, trying to come up with a good reason for um, keeping them, but we, we just couldn't do that. So we finally reluctantly had to say, all right, we've got to play by the rules. We've got to package them up, put them on pallets, you know, send them back. And at this time they were getting to be pretty old machines. Um, hated to see them go, but we had to follow the rules. A couple of weeks later, all managers got memos saying from Raleigh saying, um, if you have machines older than such and such date, they can be disposed of locally. You don't need to send them back to us. Uh, uh, that was probably precipitated by our two machines going back to them and, say, and them saying, what are we gonna do these old machines? Why don't they just scrap, scrap them locally? So I'm sorry that we didn't uh, push it a bit more to keep them, but um, they had to be scrapped, I guess. Ray, any more stories you want to, to share with us? You had your, on your last slide, there's more stories you could tell us. Well, yeah. Uh, the uh, hexadecimal, uh, hexadecimal thing was kind of interesting because it, uh, at U University of Illinois in, in the Iliac, we were, we were using, uh, we talked about sexadecimal. What's the difference? Well, hexadecimal is the, uh, Terminology is, is uh, Greek in origin, and sexadecimal is uh, uh, Latin. And the reason I mention that is because shortly after I joined IBM, I was coming down an elevator, I think, in New York City with uh, uh, sales reps, some you know guys up 
up the line. And uh, they asked me what I was doing. And I said, well, you know, I was programming in uh, and, and uh, at the Iliac. And he said, well, what'd you program in? And I said, we programmed in sexadecimal. And he sort of, you know, jerked a little bit at me. And he says, uh, <clears throat> we, we, in, we in IBM program in hexadecimal. I thought that was, you know, being rather stiff. By the way, uh, you notice I said, what what were the symbols we used? Zero through nine, KSN, JFL. Don't you all recognize that? In hexadecimal, it's A, B, C, D, E, F. But what the heck was KSN, JFL? <laughs> what we had was an old teletype uh, device, a stripped down army teletype device, which just had those keys. So we used them. And, and, and you know, some things you never forget, KSN, JFL. I can still count in JSN, J, you know, KSN, JFL, crazy. But uh, what else did I have on that list? Uh, uh, but I don't understand. If those were keys on the teletype, didn't the teletype have one key per letter in the alphabet? Per what? Didn't the teletype have one key per letter in the alphabet? Well, yeah, at one time it did, but we got a they got an army surplus one that some for some reason or other was had just those keys. I don't remember it. I mean, you know, at that time you just accepted what you had and used it. Yeah, the, by the way, you APLers, you remember the visual fidelity that we used to be able to do uh, with the 2741 entry? How'd you type, how could you type E? You typed it as F backspace L. Remember that? Yeah, my father taught me all of those. There's several others, so that I don't remember them, but uh, be kind of fun. I, re I remember those anything that looked right like you could you could over strike e over f and i think c over g and uh, things like that and it would uh, work if you wanted to call right. that Visual a a. yeah what did you say john eight over three would give you eight. Oh wow <laughs> yeah i'm a bit disappointed the dialogue apl doesn't allow those it allows some functional overstrikes, but it doesn't have the full visual fidelity thing Oh, man. Well, you basically, you probably wouldn't miss dot and the old editing where you would delve into a function, you would tell it what line number you wanted to do, you would basically put slashes under the characters you wanted to remove and then, you know, like a numbers one, two, three, four, five or ABC multiples of five for how many spaces you wanted to put in and it would backspace to the first opening and you can then put them in characters so i certainly don't miss that but uh <laughs> <laughs> no it was it was rather painful i mean i've tried it even though obviously i'm from the era of uh screens not right right but i remember this. even on ip sharp well they enhanced it a little bit you could put slash then dot or slash and then comma right, yeah. and then so it was a little less painful it was the uh i think the equivalent of edlin if you remember that from the pc so it, it was painful but really considering the overstriking and all that there was no no better way and since we didn't know of any alternatives back then it was it was fantastic really so it was not until like tube terminals or actually it was one or another HP terminal that had a kind of a block mode where you can do nice editing. But before that, any system supplied editing was, was basically, well, painful. Right. No. Uh, We're talking about the microcomputers uh, in the early 70s. And I remember back then getting exposed to one called an MCM 70. And I just looked it up and it's on Wikipedia, but it had APL in it and it had a one line display that you worked with. Mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing one and touching it and that's it. <laughs> you know, one of the things that'd be fun to do is APL was first in a lot of things. 
and uh, it'd be I think it'd be kind of fun to collect them together. Uh, you know, for example, um, there's a calc which was preceded. Uh, you know, what's the name of the thing now? Then it was Lotus One Two Three, and then Excel, right? Which is what yeah, people used to that. Yeah, it preceded Excel, but that that came out of APL. And I think there's a lot of things that were done in and with APL before others. You know, messaging, for example, we've been talking about messaging earlier. Well, uh, John I, McGrew gave a fantastic talk. Uh, I think it was in Stuttgart. I don't remember what year it was, maybe 19, no, 2016 or 2018. It was one of the best talks ever about, you know, precisely this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, All right, we ought to have John do it again, huh, John? Hey, can I invite you to speak at an EPL <laughs> campfire event, maybe? Uh, not just now. No, not I'll now. Keep it in mind. Thank you. Yeah, I'll I'll keep it in mind. Thank you. Thank you for your comment on that. By the way, I'll give you an MCM 70 story since that was brought up. Um, Yes, that had, I forget whether there's a one or a two line display, but it was very limiting. Um, and therefore, if you got a uh, syntax error, for instance, how could it even display that? And it would display it by using reverse video that machine. Off at. Uh, um, APL co-worker, he said uh, the night before the uh, the conference, he was uh, at the bar visiting with some people and um, a couple guys got talking to him um, and um, he typed in a few expressions like you know, plus scan John, one, two, three. Up. John, you're breaking Except up. Except instead of coming back with one, three, six, it came back with, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I have a bad connection here, I think. With plus scan one, two, three, uh, instead of coming back with one, three, six, it came back with answer. They said, no, 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 it's, it's APL, so it's, it's right to left. He said, no, 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 within a primitive. Oh, no, 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 so it's always right to left. So they had this big argument on that and he couldn't convince them. He said the next morning he went down for, for breakfast just before the conference opened. And he said, he saw these same two fellows trying to eat his breakfast and shaking his head. Oh, no, no, no. Saying to them. So the machine, of course, was released with uh, everything right to left, including the way it always was. So their, their version of APL was uh, different from everybody else's. Do, do I assume the machine and brought out the MCM 700? And of course, it was exactly the same because by then they had an user base and couldn't change it. So that was one of the oddities about the MCM 70. So it, it's... So it was for for things like a a minus reduction or a minus scan. It went the wrong way compared to what other APLs did. Yeah, I remember that yeah, as everything well. Everything on there was right to left, including operations S inside. Scan worked backwards. That's what the implementer thought it should do. So he did it that way. So what does it mean that it, it works backwards? Then it means it started from the at the right. So it did a reduction over the first element, then reduction over the first, uh, over the last element, then reduction over the last two elements. Eight plus scan rotate X, I guess. Well, it wouldn't just be that because what if you did a minus scan? So you'd get basically the, the ba backwards answer. So you'd have to- it's Not, not just backwards answer. It's also rever uh, switching the arguments of minus then. The operations incorrect relative to our style of thinking as well, yes. Yeah. So I remember having this discussion 
you know, from many years ago. And evidently the solution that day was to do the, you know, rotate minus scan, rotate X. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we have gone half an hour over time and uh, maybe it's time to, to stop, but uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, obviously to Ray. Uh, I hope to still see great things for, from you, including that fourth book of yours, uh, which I think you'll set a record then. Nobody else has published four books on the APL. Well, That's no, fun. no, it's only three has been published. Right, but once you publish the fourth one. Well, we we only look at what is exists currently. You know, I may, may me spend the rest of my lifetime doing this doing this new material but uh i'm uh, stimulated to do it i want i want something for high school kids I, I think that's very good it goes back to the roots of uh of apl and as iverson envisioned it as as a tool of thought and as a teaching aid and some of the early apl works were school books essentially iverson was a teacher so I'm definitely looking back uh, looking forward to the to this Ray, thank you so much. Uh, for the rest of you that chipped in with anecdotes and, and questions and so on, thank you so much for attending. And uh, I hope to see you back here if I can persuade any of those with all the interesting stories to come and speak at such an event like this. When's the uh, next one, Adam? Well, it should be in, in four weeks. Four weeks. Uh, it's supposed to be every um, every four weeks on a, on a Sunday evening at UTC time. So and the next one should be uh, on September 26, if I've done my math right. Whatever. This is a very interesting series. Thank you for holding these. Oh, well, my pleasure. So, yep. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope to see you around. Okay. See you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank, thank you, Ray. You're welcome. So long, everybody.